King of the Hill has countless fun and memorable characters, but I don't think any are quite as polarizing as Peggy Hill. This is honestly very understandable given some of her more outrageous escapades, but despite some of her stubborn, self-centered tendencies, I think Peggy is an incredibly nuanced and interesting character. So let's explore exactly what makes Peggy Hill tick. Oh yeah! I'm going to start by breaking down the character traits that I think Peggy conveys, and there are a lot. She is very capable, she's loving and passionate, especially towards her family and loved ones. She's a little repressed and naive. She was the last to realize Nancy was cheating on Dale with John Redcorn. She's also ridiculously stubborn and insecure about a lot of aspects of herself. But above all, despite her insecurities, she's incredibly confident, bordering on narcissistic. As Hank said, Peggy, you've got a pretty high opinion of yourself. She thinks she's fluent in Spanish, which she absolutely is not. Benito. This was how she felt about the very first song she ever wrote. You know, I had a feeling it was very, very good. She believes she's a genius after taking an online IQ test, but she also has real reasons to be confident about some things. She's a multiple year winner of the Substitute Teacher of the Year Award. She's an actual Boggle State champion. And over the course of the series, she's held a wide variety of jobs that she's shown to be pretty darn good at. But despite her capability, that borderline narcissism is definitely what makes people love to hate Peggy especially given the ridiculous hijinks that her overconfidence has gotten her into. I mean, let's just briefly break down some of the most ridiculous incidents. She unknowingly became a drug mule for a prisoner. She accidentally became a foot fetish model. She mistakenly kidnapped a Mexican child from Mexico on a class field trip. She punched Randy Travis and accused him of stealing her song, which to be fair, he did steal her song. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Peggy has gotten into some truly outrageous situations, and they almost always stem from her stubbornness an inability to back down from any sort of challenge or questioning of her capabilities. While it's easy to look at Peggy from the outside in and point out her obvious flaws, from a character perspective, there's actually a really well-rounded explanation for this perpetual cycle that we see Peggy go through. So let me break it down for you because I think I've got Peggy Hill pegged. I will not be a failure or look like one. One, Peggy Hill is a capable person and always has been. Throughout the series, despite her shortcomings, she has repeatedly shown that she is smart, crafty, and capable in a great variety of situations. Many of the insane scenarios she's gotten caught up in, she has found her own way out of. Two, for Peggy's entire life, her capabilities have been questioned and undermined. In the season two episode, Bobby Slam, we get a handful of flashbacks to Peggy's childhood. We see that while growing up, she repeatedly showed that she was very talented in ways that were traditionally not considered very ladylike. And because of these gender norms, she was repeatedly shut down from being able to participate in or fully explore those aspects of herself. We later learn that Peggy's mother seemed to treat her similarly growing up. There's a lot of resentment there. Three, because of the way Peggy was shut down throughout her entire life, she became deeply insecure about many aspects of herself. She was barred from doing the things that she excelled at and forced to try and do the quote ladylike things that were pushed onto her as a kid, which she wasn't particularly good at. For, as Peggy got older, she recognized that she really was capable in a lot of different ways, ways that she was repeatedly barred from growing up. This seemingly helped push that stubborn nature to the forefront. Peggy has shown over and over that she hates being told no. She hates being told what she can or can't do, and this is likely because she was told no so much growing up, even when she was capable. Five, this combination of capability, insecurity, and stubbornness became a dangerous combination for Peggy, because though she is capable, she is not capable at everything. There is a lot that she is simply bad at. But because people told her no so much growing up, and she later proved some of these were things she was actually good at, this instilled an overconfidence in her. Basically, when you tell Peggy Hill she can't do something, she's like, It became personal with me. Six, the insecurity and stubbornness created an inability to admit when she has been beaten or is wrong. Oftentimes, when Peggy is completely overwhelmed by a situation that she was not prepared for, rather than admitting failure, she doubles down and makes things worse. That is pretty much Peggy Hill in a nutshell, the Peggy Hill pattern. There's some occasional variation and twists throughout the series, so let's look at a few examples of how this pattern plays out. In season three's Peggy's Pageant Fever, Peggy decides to enter a beauty pageant, which is obviously very representative of those African mentioned ladylike things that Peggy has never been particularly good at. So this once again appeals to her insecurities. She decides to enter to prove herself, and she really believes she's going to win. With my smarts and looks and muchos talentos, well, I think I have a huge edge over these bimbos, huh, Hank? When she's challenged by Hank and Nancy, she once again doubles down. She fires Luann as her stylist and hires a professional to give her an over-the-top makeover, which ultimately dooms her. In the end, Peggy didn't win the pageant or even participate, but this is a 
a pretty solid showcase of that Peggy Hill pattern. In the episode Death in Texas, Peggy receives a letter from a prison inmate who claims that Peggy was a teacher who inspired him. So right off the bat, this person is appealing to Peggy's insecurities. She goes to see him because she wants to believe that she impacts her students in profound ways, even if that student is in jail for murder. Through their time together, Peggy is manipulated by the inmate and begins to spend a lot of time with him, at which point Hank forbids Peggy from going back to the prison. This is where that Peggy Hill stubbornness kicks in. Nobody forbids Peggy Hill. Forbidding Peggy Hill is basically the one way you can ensure she'll actually do something. When she doubles down, she's tricked into smuggling cocaine into the prison inside a boggle hourglass. And then, astoundingly, she continues to do it over and over, despite how obvious it is. Peggy's insecurities led her to the prison, and her stubbornness kept her there, getting her into deeper and deeper trouble. But Peggy isn't always this foolish. She does find her own way out of the situation. When she realizes that the inmate used all of the cocaine and there was no evidence against her, she denies any of it happened. We see this pattern over and over. Peggy gets a job at the local newspaper writing the household tips column, something she isn't very good at. When she runs out of tips that she gets from men, her overconfidence leads her to make up her own, telling people to mix bleach and ammonia for household cleaning. She basically almost mustard gasses the entire town. In season four, she accidentally becomes a foot fetish model, which honestly, there's nothing wrong with, get your money girl, but she didn't realize what she was actually getting into. When Hank shows her the true nature of the foot modeling, she doubles down and continues to model. She's basically convinced that her incredibly large feet are very desirable for certain types of people, which is true, and speaks to Peggy's insecurities directly. She's never felt beautiful or desired, so having something special about her, especially something she was previously very self-conscious of, is exactly what Peggy wanted to hear. In the end, I actually think Peggy probably should be proud of her big feet and not feel insecure about them, but ultimately she felt used and taken advantage of, which is fair given the circumstances. Alright, now let's explore a little Peggy Hill theory that's floated around the internet for a couple decades and it involves the evolution of Peggy's narcissism in relation to some specific events in the show. In season 3's finale and season 4's premiere, Hank and Peggy go skydiving for their wedding anniversary. Neither Peggy's parachute or backup chute deploy and Peggy plunges to the ground from the airplane, ending season 3 on a major cliffhanger. In the season 4 premiere, we find out that she did in fact survive the fall by falling into a very squishy and muddy field, but she breaks every bone in her body. The theory regarding this event is that after the fall, Peggy starts to portray even bigger and more bombastic narcissistic tendencies. I fell 8,000 feet and survived! Woohoo! And honestly, I think there is a strong case. I'm not sure if in-universe this would be attributed to physical trauma from the fall, or perhaps emotional trauma from her life almost ending, but it does seem like over the course of seasons 4, 5, and 6, Peggy Hill is more self-centered than ever. You have probably all heard about the suspension of popular shop teacher Mr. Hill, and his disqualification for substitute teacher of the year. One of the absolute most ridiculous examples of Peggy's narcissism is, well, everything about the episode Peggy's Fanfare, which starts with Peggy receiving a form letter from Randy Travis's lawyer about a song that she sent him. Hank, and basically everyone else, recognized that this was a formal process, but Peggy thinks this is a supportive push for her to continue to pursue songwriting. Peggy's behavior is borderline insane in this episode. Where we will get to meet our favorite country music stars, including my friend, Randy Travis. She basically completely takes over the church trip to a fair where Randy Travis is performing. Yes, but you did not get a letter from Randy Travis, and I did. <laughs> We learn that she called spaghetti and meatballs, well... Spa Peggy and meatballs. Did she say Spa Peggy? And once she meets Randy Travis, she accuses him of stealing her song. Ah! Oh! What the? You stole my song! And then punches him in the face. Now, Peggy was always a little self-centered, but the behavior in this episode is next level ridiculous. After Peggy assaults Randy Travis, she plans some revenge with Dale, and Peggy and Dale together is never a good combination. When they conspire, bad things happen. They TP Travis's trailer and accidentally push it into a pond without realizing that Randy Travis was inside the trailer. Now admittedly, based on Randy Travis's behavior in the episode, in all likelihood he did steal Peggy's song, so her anger is totally warranted. That being said, a lot of her ridiculous actions came before she learned this, and even the ones after were over the top. I mean, this episode had Hank contemplating the idea that Peggy might be willing to hurt or kill Randy Travis. That is just a lot. 
Another of the most infamous examples is, of course, Season 6's Lupe's Revenge. In this episode, Peggy demands to take over a class field trip to Mexico when their regular teacher is out sick. She, of course, believes she's fluent in Spanish, which is absolutely not true, but even goes so far as to throw away a Spanish-English dictionary that Bobby tries to bring. Your mother is a Spanish dictionary. Her Spanish incompetence leads them to a Mexican butcher rather than their planned destination, and overall, this doesn't go horribly. They have a nice time and head back to Texas. The problem comes on the way back when she accidentally shepherds a young Mexican girl onto the bus with the rest of the class. Yo vivo en México. Yes, long live Mexico. Now where are your parents? She then hides her at home and tries to figure out how to get her back to Mexico. Uh, Peggy, oh. there's a little Mexican girl in the utility closet. Peggy does successfully smuggle the girl back to Mexico, but is immediately arrested and tried for her crime. The very funny but depressing way she gets out of this one is taking the stand and talking to the court in Spanish, which makes it abundantly clear that she cannot speak Spanish. Su pudinor. Yo poder ver que usted ser caballo razonable. Now, I think what makes these two episodes kind of a bummer is the fact that Peggy doesn't get any sort of win in the end. No es culpable. Oh my god! I'm going to jail! He said you're not guilty. Oftentimes, Peggy overcomes her own mistakes, but in these, she sort of just fumbles her way out of trouble without any sort of positive ending for her as a character. But after Lupe's revenge, it seems like the writers reeled her back in and gave Peggy a little more competence. One of my favorite Peggy episodes is season six's The Substitute Spanish Prisoner, in which Peggy buys into a scam that convinces her she's a genius and one of Texas's smartest people. Also, a killer guest performance from Jeff Goldblum. It's such a pleasure and an honor and a little intimidating dating, I must say, to be standing here before you. This episode once again showcases the classic Peggy Hill pattern. Peggy feels insecure about her intelligence, takes an online IQ test that says she's a genius, and then is offered a membership to an exclusive geniuses club that validates her self-confidence. While there, she's swindled into spending $1,000 on an online PhD program, which obviously isn't real. But what I love about this episode is that it plays off of this Peggy Hill pattern and shows that even she recognizes it sometimes. She formulates a con to try and win back their money from the man who scammed them. We'll just call him Jeff Goldblum. Normally, this would be an example of Peggy doubling down, which often leads to bigger failure. She and everyone who is scammed go in on the con with another $1,000 each, and at first, the episode plays out like we would expect it to. Jeff Goldblum sees through the fake horse racing con, bails before he loses all of his money, and takes off with everyone else's money. But the genius of this episode is that Peggy actually anticipated this, and anticipated that Hank would try to come to her rescue. She installed a fake room safe in Goldblum's room, he stashes the money when Hank comes after him, and they steal the safe through the wall of the hotel. Peggy even had a backup plan to steal Goldblum's car with a fake valet. Oh, <laughs> you were gonna steal his car. That would have been a felony. So this episode represents everything I love about Peggy Hill on this show. We get to experience that typical pattern where she's duped into doing something foolish, and we also get to see her resiliently crawl out of the hole she dug for herself and come out on top. And throughout the rest of the series, Peggy's competence shines through more often than not. In Beer and Loathing, Peggy starts working for Alamo Beer and learns that some of the beer they shipped down to Mexico was contaminated, making consumers super sick. Peggy switches out the owner's beer with some from Mexico, making him sick and forcing him to admit they shipped contaminated beer. In Arlen City Bomber, Peggy rallies her fellow roller derby girls to buy their team out from under their shady owner. In Glen Peggy, Glen Ross, Peggy secures herself a job with Sizemore Realty, even after initially being fired. Peggy gets herself out of a multi-level marketing scheme that she was swindled into taking over by faking her own death and helping the representative above her get out of it as well. Ultimately, it's why I think that Peggy is such a great character. Despite her obvious shortcomings and ridiculous tendencies to dig her own grave, she is resilient and resourceful enough to dig her own way out. Even though her stubborn overconfidence and drive to silence the naysayers get her into a lot of trouble, I think it's an admirable quality. In the end, while we can all cringe at a lot of the decisions that Peggy makes, we also have to acknowledge that she is a strong and capable person who has had to overcome a lot in her life. And through it all, she's maintained a loving home and family, excelled at multiple jobs, including a substitute teacher of the year, and hell, she even wrote a hit song that was stolen by Randy Travis. Honestly, I think Peggy Hill herself said it best. That makes the score Peggy Hill 1, and people who doubt Peggy Hill, 0. So when I started researching this video, the plan was to talk about one of my favorite characters of all time, Bobby Hill. But the more Bobby-centric episodes I watched, the more I realized that you can't truly get to the root of his character 
without talking about his father, Hank Hill. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the most important aspect of King of the Hill is Hank and Bobby's relationship. Now, obviously King of the Hill is about a lot of things, but I think that at its core, it's about a father and son who want to understand each other, who want to relate to each other. They are such different people. I mean, one of Hank's literal catchphrases illustrates this. That boy ain't right. In spite of this, there are dozens of stories in which Hank and Bobby both make great efforts to connect with each other to find some kind of common ground. But that boy ain't right represents more than just the differences between Hank and Bobby. It represents Hank's entire worldview. The the reason that Hank becomes so deeply uncomfortable when Bobby does something that he doesn't understand or perceives as abnormal can also be traced back to the way that he himself was raised. So with that, let's take a deep dive and look at the true heart of King of the Hill, Hank and Bobby. Why are you always trying to turn me into you? Why can't you accept me for who I am? All right, first let's talk a little bit about how Hank was raised. Now this won't be a full dissection of his father, Cotton Hill, because frankly, I'll probably do an entire video on him at some point, but in order to understand Hank's worldview, you have to look at how Cotton treated him his entire life. You've been babying him ever since he was a baby. Cotton basically feels an intense resentment towards Hank. Without getting too deep into the weeds on details, Cotton associates Hank's birth with what he feels is one of his greatest failures in his life, the failure to assassinate Cuban dictator Fidel Castro. It's hard to say that without laughing. Obviously, Hank himself didn't actually have anything to do with this. Where and when he was born isn't Hank's fault. But even so, this created a resentment towards Hank that literally never ended, up till Cotton's death. But more importantly, it informed the way Cotton raised Hank. Cotton belittled Hank endlessly, never even giving him a chance to succeed. We see this firsthand through flashbacks. You're never gonna be a war hero like me if you shoot like that. No wonder that kid from the playground stole your pail. And the trauma from these events deeply rooted itself in Hank at a young age, to the point where it would resurface in adulthood. Heck, sometimes it didn't need to resurface because Cotton would just straight up repeat the behavior to his adult son. Accuracy? Better hope that target's the side of a barn. Cotton wouldn't even consider letting Hank enroll in his boot camp alma mater and refused to let him set foot on its grounds even when he was an adult when Bobby was enrolling. Sadly, the way Cotton raised Hank informed the way Hank would view his own son while raising him. And this, combined with the societal norms that were also deeply entrenched in Hank, created a real disconnect between himself and his son. Don't smile, son, you're a working man. Hank's discomfort towards anything he doesn't understand is so apparent in his relationship with Bobby, and Hank's natural reaction to these things is to get upset and reject them. He thinks Bobby should be normal. He didn't make a single dumb joke, he was just Regular. Hank is a very stern and straight-laced person. He completely represses certain emotions in so many aspects of his life. You know, I don't think I've ever seen you guys kiss. Your father has kissed me. Peggy! But the times where Hank's emotions actually break through that repression so often involve Bobby. And these are for sure my favorite moments in the series. Like, between the gut-busting laughs, this is the stuff that gets me emotional with the show. While they aren't the only examples, there are generally a few formulas in episodes that revolve around Hank and Bobby. The first goes like this. Bobby gains an interest in something that Hank is also interested in, or at least something he respects. Bobby somehow disappoints Hank while pursuing that interest, and then in the end, they find a way to bond over it. There are some great episodes that follow this formula, like in What Makes Bobby Run, when Bobby becomes the school mascot. Hank is absolutely overjoyed that Bobby is part of a football tradition. So you're not prancing around the garage at all, you're training. But when Bobby bails on the traditional mascot pummeling, Hank is obviously deeply embarrassed. In the end, Bobby makes up for it with a daring heist of the opposing team's mascot and happily accepts the pummeling from the football team. Bobby just started a new tradition. Or the miseducation of Bobby Hill when Bobby actually takes an interest in selling propane, something that normally Hank would be completely ecstatic about. But Hank is not stoked when Bobby starts to use cheap sales tactics to help sell grills. Hank is a man of integrity, and Bobby ends up with a whole mess of upset customers because he didn't do his due diligence. Hank, of course, sweeps in to save the day with his impeccable customer service. I love this one because not only does Hank show a real confidence in Bobby to work in propane, the great ones practice the basics. So you thought I could be a great one too? But Bobby also can't help but gush about his dad's major success. In the end, they both take pride in each other. Another of my absolute favorites is season 8's Living on Reds, Vitamin C, and Propane, when Hank and Bobby rent a semi-truck to deliver some furniture to Hank's mom. Bobby is just so excited that he and his dad are truckers, and Hank is fulfilling a real dream of his as well, while also connecting with his son over something he loves. But when they get called out by real truckers, they're both brought down to earth a little bit. I thought you said we were truckers. We are. I don't mean to spoil your fun, sir, but you're not a trucker. 
You're just a guy with a truck. This is such a well-executed moment because obviously both of them are disappointed for not being considered real truckers, but for Hank, it's a lot more than that. Not only was his dream of being a real trucker dashed, but he let down his son in the process. It's a double whammy. Hank was fulfilling two dreams and they both came crashing down at once. A genuine connection with Bobby was taken away. Also, Dale, Bill, and Boomhauer stow away in the back of the truck, which leads to one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Later, Hank nearly falls asleep at the wheel, so Bobby decides to let him sleep in the cab and to have the other guys keep on trucking through the night to make it on schedule, which ends up stranding them on the top of a mountain. Hank leads them on a daring retreat down the mountain that ultimately earns the respect of the truckers they meet at the next stop. In this one, Bobby did have a pretty major mess up in getting them stranded on that mountain, but the mistake led to them doing something incredible that earned them true respect. Bobby and Hank were real truckers, and Hank even fulfilled another dream. You mean like a, a convoy? damn straight. God, that's a good episode. You just rewatch that one. It's great. Another common formula we see for these Hank and Bobby stories go like this. Bobby will gain an interest in something that deeply upsets Hank, and then one of two things happen. One, Bobby will actually come to learn from Hank's point of view and see why it upset him. Or two, Hank will grow to understand something new about that hobby that he respects, which of course gives him more respect for Bobby. There are a handful of episodes where we see Bobby really learn from Hank's point of view, like when he saves him from drinking dog's blood in The Witches of East Arlen. Me? drink dog blood? That's not my thing. Or when he rescues him from a really uncomfortable situation at a co-ed slumber party and get your freak off. Oh, thank God. I think my favorite is in Fish and Wildlife. Hank wants to teach Bobby how to be self-reliant and catch his own food, but instead Bobby gets involved with some real shady hippies who end up stealing Hank's fishing gear and truck. Obviously, Bobby learns a harsh lesson because he feels awful about the trouble he caused, but the best moment comes at the very end. Hank asks Bobby if he's ready to go home after their long ordeal. Ready to go home? Not yet, Dad. We still gotta pick up dinner. These moments are what the show is all about, and honestly, where this relationship really shines. But honestly, the times when Hank learns from Bobby are what really makes the relationship work for me. Bobby is a kid, so he should be learning from his father. But Hank is a very stubborn man, and when his own son is able to expand his worldview, it's always really satisfying. And most importantly, it always helps Hank discover a new way to love and appreciate Bobby, which really fills my heart. Some of the best episodes of the series showcase this dynamic. Like in Life in the Fast Lane, Bobby Saga, when Bobby gets a job working for Jimmy Witchard at the racetrack. It's incredibly clear that Jimmy is a dangerous, awful boss, and Bobby wants to quit, but Hank thinks Bobby is just trying to get out of working. But when he finally recognizes that Bobby wasn't just trying to be lazy, and that Jimmy was genuinely putting his son in danger, he completely snaps. Sometimes it takes a rude awakening for Hank to shift his worldview. Another incredible episode is Goodbye Normal Jeans when Bobby shows a real impressive knack for home ec class. At first, Hank's gender normative worldview sees a real issue with this. He considers it women's work. But once Hank realizes just how impressive Bobby is at this stuff, he changes his tune. In fact, Hank is so supportive that he wants Bobby to make the entire Thanksgiving meal. There are so many great moments between the two of them in this episode, I really love it. Bobby and I were up all night talking. Really, really talking. But I think there's one episode that really shows what I'm talking about here perfectly. Meet the Propaniacs is legendary. Hank is obviously someone who genuinely does not understand comedy. Like, try to think of a single moment in King of the Hill where Hank truly and genuinely laughs. There are not many of them. But when Bobby caters his improv skills to a propane-centric audience, it actually gets through to Hank. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> God help me, I love it. It was so successful that they decided to take the show on the road. You will be called the Propane Maniacs. No, no, the Propaniacs. <laughs> Bro, hold up, look how angry Peggy is here. Oh my God, uh, that's classic. But more importantly, Hank actually gets to connect with his son over propane, and Bobby actually gets to connect with his father over comedy. Yep, those were some good times. Bobby tell me something about comedy and then I'd teach him a little bit about propane. It's literally both of their dreams combined. In the end, an unfortunate incident with the Texas propane commissioner basically ends the Propaniac's successful run, which puts Hank really down in the dumps. You didn't think it was funny? It's not that it's not funny, Bobby. In fact, it's the funniest thing I've ever heard. To make up for it, they try to get the Propaniacs back together at a local mall, off the propane circuit. Obviously, the humor doesn't land with general audiences, but that's not what's important to Bobby. It was always about the connection he was making with his dad. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
Oh, <laughs> God, this is such a good moment. Guys, I'm telling you, this is what the show's about. The reason that these incredible moments between Hank and Bobby work is because of what it means for both of them as characters. Hank's relationship with Cotton scarred him for life, but in the end, we know that Hank is a much better person and father than Cotton because of this dynamic with Bobby. Hank could have allowed history to repeat itself and push Bobby towards a repressed lifestyle. Even though it's sometimes a long road to get there, the fact that Hank is actually able to admit when he is wrong or accept ideas that he previously rejected shows exactly how he is a great father to Bobby. A lot of people think Bobby's funny. The kid's only 13 years old and he's already sold a joke to this Yakov Smirnov. Even though he struggles to understand Bobby, he is able to shift his perspective and see what things are good and what things are bad for his son, even if he doesn't fully understand them. Cotton never did this for Hank. In fact, the way Cotton treated Hank for his entire life completely destroyed his confidence. Hank had to find his own sense of confidence later in life from things like playing football or later propane. In fact, one of the reasons that Hank is so loyal to Buck Strickland, despite his obvious character flaws, is because he's a surrogate father figure. He actually believed in Hank in a way that Cotton never did and gave him his opportunity in propane. Hank built his literal entire adult life around propane. And I think we can assume that this is at least subconsciously Hank trying to make his father figure proud, something he was never able to do growing up. Ultimately, despite the stumbles and disagreements along the way, Hank always finds a reason to be proud of and support Bobby's most important endeavors, even the ones he initially rejects. And because of this, Bobby is an incredibly confident kid. Even though he's weird and awkward, he's also charming and funny. And the confidence that he's built thanks to that support garners him really great opportunities in life. Bobby Hill knows who he is, and he knows what he's good at. When he finds something he's interested in, he dives in head first without caring what the world might think. I mean, by all accounts, Bobby is a funny looking kid, but one absolutely consistent thing throughout the show is that he is pretty successful with women. They don't always end well, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? But you can't deny his confidence. They even juxtapose him with his best friend Joseph, who's a more typical jock, someone you might expect to be more naturally confident in a school setting. But instead, they show just how much Joseph admires Bobby's ability to charm and his natural charisma. In fact, Bobby delivers what I think is one of the most inspiring messages in the entire show. Mom, I'm fat, but big deal. Just because there are some people in the world who want me to feel bad about it, doesn't mean I have to. Honestly, this is an attitude that I am so envious of. Bobby knows he doesn't have to let the world or society dictate what he is or isn't. He knows who he is. So Bobby Hill's fat. <laughs> He's also funny. He's nice. He's got a lot of friends, a girlfriend. This is everything that Hank is not. Hank is so fixated on what the world might think of him. He's so afraid of showing vulnerability. And that's frankly because of the person who raised him. But despite this, Hank raised someone who loves who he is and isn't afraid to be vulnerable. Despite Hank's entire personality being the antithesis of this attitude, when it counts, he supports Bobby despite his own discomfort. That is what makes Hank a great father. He makes the right decisions in spite of himself. It's not Hank's fault he ended up so repressed, but you have to give him credit for being able to push through that repression to help his son succeed. I'm a broken record, but this is what the entire show is all about. Yes, there is a huge cast of incredible, funny, nuanced characters, but the heart and core of the series is Hank and Bobby Hill, and I can prove it. Besides the fact that so many episodes focus on their dynamic, it's which episodes focus on them that's most important, namely the pilot and the series finale. While back in the original pilot, the characterizations felt a bit different, there is a clear focus on Bobby and Hank's relationship. In the episode, Hank is investigated by child services because of his anger. Bobby gets a black eye playing baseball and they suspect it was Hank. After it's cleared up, they call off the investigation, but Bobby decides not to tell his parents because of the way Hank was treating him. But I like him better this way. How come? I can make him love me even when I screw up. The very first episode of the show establishes that Bobby doesn't think Hank even really likes him, let alone is proud of him. Hank pushes through this repression to tell Bobby how he really feels about him. I'm not just a big disappointment to you. Disappointment? 
No, you make me proud. King of the Hill immediately establishes that this is the heart of the series in the very first episode, and then they set it in stone by making the series finale focus on their relationship as well. This final episode, To Sirloin with Love, is entirely about Bobby having a major success story that connects him with Hank, and makes Hank proud. Bobby showcases a real talent for judging meets, and joins a competitive team at the Heimlich County Junior College. But after he realizes that his teammates are into the sport for all the wrong reasons, he quits the team, much to Hank's chagrin. I'm quitting the team. What? No! We were so close! But here's why I think King of the Hills series finale is one of the best and most satisfying out there. When Bobby sees that Hank got him his own grill so that they can grill together, it becomes clear what this was all about for Hank. Why Hank was so upset that Bobby quit the team. This isn't about you being on a team. It isn't even about beef. What your father cares about is that you two finally have something in common. Kind of recontextualizes this line, doesn't it? We were so close! Like I said, this was always what the show was about. It's Hank and Bobby, despite their differences, trying to relate to each other. And Bobby does the right thing here. He decides to go to the tournament, not because he wants to compete or because he wants to judge meets, but because he wants to make his father proud. He wants to maintain that connection that they have. On top of this, the actual team, including Hank, gets stranded after the opposing team hijacks their bus, and Bobby has to compete in every competition all by himself. And he gets them all the way to the finals. There's this really great moment at the end. The team shuns Bobby when they arrive, but Hank sparks in him the confidence he needs to make the right decision. Are you sure? Yes, I am. Then it's time to speak up. Bobby jumps in despite his teammates' protest and wins the entire competition. He did literally the entire thing by himself. Despite pushback from his teammates, it's, it's one of his most impressive accomplishments across the show. We've seen Bobby do some really impressive things competitively before, like the rifle competition, dog dancing, rose growing, but Bobby didn't place first in those. This time, he won the championship and he did it all on his own. I think one of my favorite moments here is a simple one. Bobby is being hoisted by his teammates and Hank walks up to him and he shakes his hand. I know you'd expect a father and son to hug, but this is Hank Hill we're talking about. A handshake is the firmest sign of respect he can give you. Hank respects Bobby. This finale is so damn good. The final scene makes me tear up every single time. Well, Dad, it looks like this is the last one. Oh, you're just getting started, Bobby. You'll be grilling your whole life. Just like you. The show begins with Hank and Bobby struggling to relate to each other, and it ends with them effortlessly coming together and sharing in something they both love. And that, folks, is why Hank and Bobby are the heart of King of the Hill. Yep. Yep. King of the Hill is a show defined by familial relationships. At the heart of the series is Hank, his son Bobby, and their struggles to find connection through their vastly different worldviews. But resting above that relationship is a man named Cotton Hill. He killed 50 men, lost his shins in the war, and is the root of a lot of the generational trauma that has been passed down through Hank and Bobby. But despite Cotton being an unjustifiably awful father, husband, and human being, his life and general existence is actually pretty tragic. It's fascinating to look at the circumstances surrounding his pain and his resentment, and though it doesn't excuse his behavior, it does paint a nuanced picture of a very sad man. So join me as we look at the tragic life and death of Cotton Hill. Cotton Hill joined the military during World War II when he was only 14 years old. Over the course of the series, Cotton told countless stories about his time in the war, though there are disputes in regards to whether or not every story is fact. Some of the things he claims don't quite line up. Well, how did my dad fight in Germany and Japan at the same time? But what we do know is that while fighting in Japan, Cotton's shins were basically shot off. His account of this incident is brutal and includes him beating his assailants to death with his own friend's leg. I woke up in a field hospital and they were sewing my feet to my knees. This is obviously the major defining event in Cotton's life. He was allegedly 6'4 before he lost his shins and 5 foot even after he lost them. It's easy to see how this could make somebody resentful. His doctor even said he would never be able to walk again, but Cotton is nothing if not stubborn. 18 months later, he walked right over to that doctor, 
reached up and punched him in the kidneys. Now, obviously, Cotton was raised in a different time, and he had a lot of resentment and trauma built from his experience in World War II, and these things dictated how he treated his son Hank growing up, which is to say, not good. And it didn't help that Hank's birth itself prevented Cotton from achieving a major goal of his own, assassinating Cuban dictator Fidel Castro in New York City. So resentment was all too familiar for Cotton in nearly every aspect of his life, but in particular for his son Hank. He was crying the second he popped his head out of his mama. In fact, the way Cotton raised Hank very effectively explains so much about who Hank became as a man. Cotton suffered such hardships that he had absolutely no empathy for his son, even when he was a literal child. I got my shin blown off by a Japan man's machine gun. So don't come crying to me with your problem. Cotton never gave Hank any positive support or encouragement. Hank's failures were met with derision from a very young age. You're never gonna be a war hero like me if you shoot like that. No wonder that kid from the playground stole your pail. As he got older, this didn't let up either. In fact, it arguably got worse. Cotton outright told Hank to his face what he thought would happen if he had gotten drafted. Some of you, like Hank, We'll be killed. Even through Hank's high school career, Cotton would blame him for things that he had absolutely no control over, like when he broke his ankle in the big football game. This is your fault. And you got them weak ankles from your mommy. He was a miserably awful father to Hank, and this led Hank to develop into the incredibly repressed man we see in King of the Hill. Any sign of emotion or weakness, as Cotton would consider it, is now buried deep inside of Hank. In fact, I think there are maybe only three times we see Hank cry over the course of the show. When he thinks Bill dies, when Lady Bird runs away, and when his truck is breaking down, but I can't really think of any others. Cotton's attempt at a sex talk for Hank consisted of bringing him to a farm to watch a bull mate with a cow, which likely contributed to Hank's immense sexual repression we see throughout the show as well. I don't think I've ever seen you guys kiss. Your father has kissed me. Peggy! But Cotton's mistreatment of Hank goes even further than his childhood and teenage years. Over the course of the series, we see Cotton mistreat Hank on a regular basis, and it often undermines Hank's own life and relationships. In season two's premiere, Hank and Bobby are connecting over sport shooting competitions, but Hank initially struggles to find his shot because of his traumatic memories of his father teaching him to use a rifle. Hank eventually works through those issues and does really well in the competition until Cotton shows up, regressing Hank. I got money riding on this shot. On the McKay's. Cotton is persistently questioning Hank's manhood and putting him down, but aside from this, he also refuses to show him even the simplest common courtesy. When Hank was temporarily blinded, Cotton wouldn't even let him touch his shoulder to guide him into the house. Late in the series, when Cotton is giving up his Cadillac, Hank wants to buy it, partially because he took care of the car his entire life, but also so that he could have something that connects him with his father, a father he feels he has very little connection with. Cotton instead decides to give the car away to Hank's cousin Dusty. Dusty's always been like a son to me. I'm your son. Oh yeah, and Hank's cousin Dusty is actually none other than ZZ Top, the famous musician who has countless cars and no need for Cotton's Cadillac. Cotton even pretends to be sorry about this to Hank later in the episode, but only to create drama for Dusty's reality TV show. And Cotton's disrespect for Hank gets even more blatant as well. In one episode, he plays keep away with Hank's gluteal prosthetic, something he needs for his debilitating back pain. In another, he gets Hank drunk, strips him naked, ties him up, and locks him in the Alamo. He relentlessly mistreats his son throughout his entire life, and Hank continues to try and make his father proud, though it does reach a boiling point a few times. In the episode The Father, the Son, and JC, Hank actually pushes back on Cotton's mistreatment in one of the most meaningful ways he ever has. Because of Cotton's nature, Hank was never comfortable expressing his feelings towards his father, likely because he actually wasn't a quality father figure in his life. But one person who did support Hank in ways that Cotton never did was Buck Strickland. Now, Buck is obviously not a perfect father figure either. Hank basically keeps Strickland propane running and doesn't get the credit he deserves. At least until this episode, when Buck decides to promote him from assistant manager to manager. But Hank's repression and unresolved paternal trauma cause him to blurt out something pretty embarrassing in response. Mr. Strickland, I, I, did, I, I love you. This actually loses Hank the promotion, but interestingly, it also causes jealousy in Cotton, who goes so far as to uninvite his own son from Christmas dinner. This is such an interesting premise because the core of the conflict is so contradictory to how Cotton carries himself and treats Hank. He expects the love and adoration that Hank gives Buck without actually doing any of the legwork to earn it. And this episode even showcases likely the most resentment for Cotton we've ever seen from Hank as well. I hate the man. 
Huh. Feels good every time I say it. In fact, after extensive therapy-like conversations with Jimmy Carter, the absolute closest to reconciliation these two get is admitting that they wouldn't obliterate the other one from existing. They simply agree that they would like to continue to exist in the same world as the other one, and nothing more. My father said he wouldn't obliterate me? His words? The level of repression and resentment these two feel for each other is incredibly unhealthy, but it makes for some great TV. In one of the final moments of the episode, Hank and Cotton bond over their shared appreciation for shooting nail guns, and I think that this is probably the closest Cotton will ever come to telling his son he loves him. Which is pretty sad, but this is still a sweet moment. Boy, I love shooting a nail gun. I love shooting a nail gun too. And Cotton's resentment extends beyond Hank as well. Cotton has a habit of expecting people to suffer and experience the same things he has, at least to a degree. I actually showed a clip from the pilot episode earlier that illustrates this. Cotton writes off Hank's scraped knee because he himself lost his shins. He judges Hank's experience against his own and feels it isn't worth feeling any pity over, and he treats a lot of people this way throughout the show. In the episode An Officer and a Gentle Boy, we see it in action. Hank decides Bobby needs some firmer boundaries in his life, and he and Cotton decide to send him to Cotton's old military academy, Fort Burke, to toughen him up. Interestingly, Cotton never even offered Hank the opportunity to go to Fort Burke, despite Hank wishing he could go. Hank wanted so desperately to get his father's approval, but Cotton wasn't even willing to offer an opportunity to impress him. It's another level of resentment. Bobby's time at Fort Burke is different though. The school changed a lot over the years. The punishments and hazing rituals softened significantly. Of course, this doesn't work for Cotton, who suddenly resents the school for not offering the same harsh environment that he himself faced as a kid. So he takes over the school and shapes it back to its former ways. But to Cotton's shock, Bobby is more resilient than anybody could have expected. He handles Cotton's hazing and punishments with ease, including solitary confinement in the hole for three days, one entire day longer than Cotton spent there. And on top of it, Bobby is barely even bothered when he emerges. This sort of shakes the foundation of Cotton's worldview, as Bobby's kind and softer nature would, to him, suggest that he would never handle such difficulties. But maybe the way Bobby carries himself actually makes him stronger than the generations that come before. This is really one of the only times that Cotton acknowledges his way might not be the best way, and even so, it's a fleeting moment. Because throughout the show, Cotton treats just about everyone he meets with the regressive attitude of his era, particularly the women. There are smaller instances, like how after Luann fixes Cotton's car, he scoffs at the very idea that she could have done this sort of quote-unquote man's work. That's like a pig trying to read. Pig? Or when Reverend Stroop starts to work in Arlen for the first time, and he immediately starts to recite from memory all of the verses of the Bible that suggest she shouldn't be able to preach. Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission. Corinthians. And then there's of course the way he treats his own wife Dee Dee. He basically uses her as a live-in maid to do his bidding and of course rub his legs with shin jelly. In fact, when the family was in dire straits financially, Cotton left Dee Dee because she tried to work for herself to support them. It's a real deep-seated resentment stemming from the time in which he was raised and that stubbornness harms himself along with his loved ones. Cotton wasn't even around when Dee Dee gave birth to his son G.H. Bobby drove Dee Dee to the hospital and cut the umbilical cord. Hell, Bobby basically was the only one taking care of the kid for the first week out of the hospital. Cotton did nothing to support his wife, who was experiencing extreme postpartum depression. Though, I think perhaps the most interesting relationship in regards to Cotton's backwards views on women is none other than Peggy Hill, or Hank's wife as he refers to her. I actually don't think there's a single time where Cotton calls her Peggy. It's always Hank's wife, which is pretty representative of the way he views women in relation to men. To Cotton, Peggy only has value as Hank's wife, not as her own person. And any problems with the Hill household, those are Peggy's fault, not Hank's. Hank, your wife let the salt run out. Flour, sugar, dog food, soda pop. The first real appearance of Cotton in season one pretty much revolves around this. Cotton effectively forces his way into staying with Hank and Peggy, Peggy immediately objects and doesn't want him staying with them, pointing out how awful his behavior is and suggesting it's not good for Bobby to see that. 
but Hank, constantly seeking his father's approval, makes excuses for Cotton and ignores Peggy. You just cannot see your father for who he is. And sure enough, Cotton's awful behavior rubs off on Bobby in the worst ways. But when Hank tries to confront Cotton, he tells him his pitiable sob story about his shins to try and weasel out of any sort of confrontation or accountability. Which of course works on Hank, who as we've established, has a very broken relationship to his father. But it comes to a head when Bobby starts a sexist riot at school. Ah, that's woman's work! Eat that right, fellas? Women's work! Women's work! Fortunately, while Hank is repressed and has some stubborn viewpoints, he's a good and decent man who ultimately loves and supports his wife. And he knows that Cotton's worldview and behavior isn't acceptable. And I won't let him grow up to be a woman-hating old fool. No wonder mom left you. She was a strong lady, classy and smart like Peg. Now, I've talked a lot about Peggy, and we all know that she's got some very frustrating personality traits, but I think it's undeniable that through all of the abuse she suffered from Cotton, she seemed to grow to understand him better than almost anyone else. This is about a man who for 50 years denied any human emotion so he could hide from his haunting memories of war, ruining his relationship with his son. Peggy and Cotton almost had a symbiotic antagonistic relationship with one another, as though their resentment for one another also fueled them. After Peggy broke all her bones in that skydiving accident, she struggled immensely with her physical therapy, but it was actually Cotton who motivated her and helped her regain her strength. Cotton was able to use his boot camp-like tactics to continue to berate and abuse Peggy. That abuse was the fuel Peggy needed to try and succeed in spite of Cotton, and it worked. I would say that this was the closest Peggy and Cotton ever came to an actual functioning relationship, nearly a friendship even. Cotton, may I have this dance? This, of course, wasn't a lasting bond, but I do think their rivalry was incredibly important to the series, which to me is pretty explicitly proven by her role in Cotton's final episode, Death Picks Cotton, but we'll get there soon. And outside of this, there were just countless ways that Cotton mistreated Peggy throughout the series, sometimes even suggesting horrific things. Remember, under no circumstances is the wife allowed in my Cadillac car. And then she's in a bag in the trunk. But Cotton's stubborn, ancient, and outdated views do sort of get to the core of the tragedy of Cotton's life. Because though his actions are inexcusable and unjustifiable, they do stem from his own tragic past. Cotton's repressed trauma and archaic worldview, combined with the fact that society tends to overlook and disrespect both veterans and the disabled, led to an existence where Cotton feels incredibly disrespected, but still incapable of any meaningful change. Cotton is so stubborn about his own worldview, and we see this in the way that he treats his son, his wife, all women, and people in general. And because his worldview is outright offensive to modern society, he is in turn met with disrespect respect, oftentimes deservedly, but not always. In the episode when Cotton comes marching home, he and Dee Dee are in financial crisis. The bank even repossesses their house. Cotton is forced to get a job and becomes a greeter at a restaurant, but now sitting low on the totem pole in a service industry position, Cotton isn't treated with any semblance of respect. Whoa, 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 whoa. what are you doing? He was waiting, I'm showing him to a table. That's the hostess's job. You're a greeter. Now please return to your stool. Eventually, this disrespect sends Cotton off the deep end when he's told he can't get work off to march in the Veterans Day Parade, which to me is really messed up. Cotton doesn't show others much respect, but I'm definitely not cheering for a corporation to take advantage of an old man. And conversely, Cotton is shown to be most happy when he is being treated with respect, even when it's undue or false respect. In the episode Dale Tech, Cotton starts to stay with Hank, but the family basically doesn't have the time to keep an eye on him, so they put him in an elderly daycare facility. This dashes his spirits pretty significantly, and after he throws a tantrum, the police are called, and he's actually given more respect by the police officers. They even make him an honorary officer to watch over Hank's neighborhood. Now, given his behavior, I definitely don't think Cotton was owed this level of respect, especially given how quickly he abuses his newly perceived power. While trying to solve a mystery for Hank, he nearly whips Bobby and Peggy. Like, literally, with a real whip. To his credit, Cotton does eventually solve Hank's mystery for him, but it's fascinating how quickly he abuses his power. The man will do concerning things when he feels he's being treated with high levels of adoration. This actually comes into play in a big way in Death Buys a Timeshare, when Cotton, Bill, and Hank vacation to Mexico to attend a timeshare presentation. The goal is to get a free vacation by refusing to buy the timeshare. Unfortunately, because these timeshare folks are just salesmen trying to get on their customer's good side, they show Cotton an incredibly high degree 
degree of respect. He's basically treated like a king, given the nicest suites, invited to exclusive parties, and of course, as Cotton has barely shown respect in his everyday life, he takes to it immediately, and he buys a timeshare. Colonel, I wasn't supposed to tell you this because you're not an owner yet, but you've already been handpicked by O. Kelly to join his El Presidente circle. Hank actually comes through for Cotton in a pretty nice way in this episode. The timeshare folks realize that Cotton doesn't have any assets for them to leverage, so they don't sell him a timeshare, but Hank sees how much it means to him. Since all my buddies kicked off, things just ain't felt right. But now I got me some place where I belong. In order to let Cotton spend time at these fancy parties that actually make him feel happy, Hank buys the timeshare himself, a truly selfless act for a man who did not really deserve it. While Cotton is a sad, horrible man, there were those occasional glimpses of humanity in him. However brief, the man definitely loved his grandson Bobby. But you know, even though he hates most things, he does love Bobby. <laughs> in fact, he even makes a pretty huge sacrifice for Bobby in Revenge of the Loot Fisk. A series of events where Bobby eats all of Reverend Stroop's Loot Fisk leads to him accidentally setting fire to the entire church, but Cotton ends up being falsely accused of the crime. When Bobby eventually comes clean about the incident, Cotton actually decides he will take the fall, because he doesn't want to see Bobby punished for his mistake. This is probably the one truly selfless thing we've ever seen Cotton do, and it's nice that even beneath his awful behavior, there is still love, even if it barely ever shines through. This, of course, does not excuse his excessively awful behavior throughout the series, and to suggest Cotton is actually a good person because of his few truly human moments would be a ludicrous argument to make, but it still gives us some great, genuine, heartfelt moments in the show. And those moments do go a really long way to tug at the heartstrings, even when they're facilitated through Cotton's selfishness. In season three, Hank and Peggy are trying to get pregnant and have another child, but because of Hank's narrow urethra, they're struggling immensely. Meanwhile, Cotton and Dee Dee get pregnant on accident, which obviously upsets Peggy. But Cotton becomes overwhelmed by the thought of raising a child at his age, and simultaneously actually shows genuine sadness over Hank and Peggy's pregnancy struggles. Your daddy's the right age to be having baby. Poor Hank and Hank's wife, they want another baby real bad. Of course, Cotton's solution is still a selfish one. He runs away, abandoning his responsibility as the child's father, and in his mind, gifting his son a child. But obviously, he's really just thrusting the responsibility onto Hank. This leads to probably my favorite Cotton and Hank moment in the entire show, as Hank and Cotton lament their own pregnancy problems. Hell, if it's a contest on who's the better daddy, you win. I mean, you made Bobby. All I made was you. It's so impressive how the show was able to give us these scenes that feel like real moments of love and connection between Hank and Cotton, while still allowing Cotton to undercut it with a jab at Hank. Vintage Cotton, truly. And all things considered, it does seem like Cotton improved slightly as a father when raising his next son, Good Hank, or GH for short. I mean, it's wild how even just naming his newborn son was a slight at Hank. But we do see evidence that Cotton was trying harder with GH than he did with Hank. We see that he's got countless home videos of GH that he's taken himself, showing much more care and attention than he did to Hank. At the end of When Cotton Comes Marching Home, he even accepts Hank's financial help for GH's sake. Hank, I thought it over. I've decided to let you give me some money. You know, for GH. This is actually one of the biggest instances we've seen of Cotton growing past his own hangups. He wouldn't accept help initially because he feels it's his responsibility to provide for his family, and not doing so makes him feel like less of a man. But by accepting Hank's help, he looks beyond his own self-esteem and does the best thing for his child. It's a great moment. But despite these occasional examples of Cotton's growth, his repressed trauma would ultimately follow him to his death. In Cotton's final episode, his PTSD triggers a violent response at a Benny Hanna a type restaurant. Cotton ends up breaking bones and badly burning himself on this giant grill, and the doctors give him very little time to live. I think the saddest thing about this episode is the way that Cotton continues to berate and belittle Hank until his literal death. Hank tries so hard to reconcile and make amends with his father, but Cotton wouldn't have it. I love you too, Dad. You loves me? Dad? What kind of man tells another man he loves him? I don't want to die with my sissy son who loves me. After this exchange, it looks like Cotton dies, and afterwards Hank fully blames himself. He even claims that he picked a fight with Cotton on his deathbed, which obviously is not what happened. The man just tried to reconcile his complicated feelings with his father. Even while dying, Cotton undermines Hank's well-being. I mean, he requests arguably the most insane thing anyone has ever requested on their deathbed. I want you to cut off my head and mail it to the Japanese Emperor. 
Hank tries desperately for the entire rest of the episode to tell his father he loves him. It's kind of sad to watch. It's Hank's last chance to connect with the father who he has desperately sought the approval of his entire life, approval he has never been given, and instead of any type of closure, he's chastised. I couldn't stand the torture of hearing your baby crying about your daddy dying. <laughs> Honestly, one of my favorite moments in all of King of the Hill is Cotton's death, because it so perfectly encapsulates so many important aspects of the series. On his deathbed, Peggy confronts Cotton and chews him out for the way he treated Hank his entire life. Even when Cotton is berating Peggy, she instead defends the man she loves. But it also shows that Peggy, as I claimed earlier, truly understands Cotton. She knew exactly what Cotton needed to hear. I hope you do go on living forever as the unhappy person you are in the hell you have created here on Earth. I mentioned that symbiotic antagonistic relationship between these two earlier, and I think this illustrates it perfectly. The man literally wasn't able to die until he found peace through defying this person who he hated most. I hope you live forever. I really do. Do you now? <laughs> Cotton died the way he lived, defiant, angry, without showing any sort of affection for his son, and all while berating Peggy. But you know Cotton's impact on Hank wasn't going to end with his death, because there's one last episode that really grapples with Cotton's legacy and the shadow his life cast over Hank's. In the final season, Hank is tasked with handling Cotton's will. Hank sees this as his last chance to find meaning in his relationship with his father. Even dead. Cotton will always find a way to disrupt our lives. It leads him and his friends on a wild scavenger hunt to ultimately flush Cotton's ashes down General S. Patton's toilet. And while Hank doesn't actually find connection with his father through this misadventure, he does realize that the people Cotton did connect with were his friends. The friends who had also since passed on. And through this realization, he sees the value in the friendships that he has made, and the length that those friends go to help him. And I think this was actually the absolute perfect way to end Hank's saga with Cotton. Because ultimately, though Cotton was an awful father who never gave Hank the love or respect he deserved, Hank was a stronger man, and he was able to achieve a better, more fulfilling life in spite of his father. Hank has a loving wife, an amazing son, and an incredible group of friends. And he did that without the help of Cotton Hill. Hell, he did it while actively fighting against the trauma inflicted on him by Cotton Hill. And this final story represents that beautifully, as Hank learns an important life lesson while dealing with his father's extreme expectations. The ultimate irony is that Cotton was always ashamed of Hank, but Hank was actually one of the only genuine accomplishments in Cotton's life one of the only good things to come from his legacy. Cotton Hill's life was tragic, but not because he's just a sad or sympathetic figure. His history is heartbreaking for sure, but his life is tragic because his stubbornness created his own personal hell and the people around him were swept up in it. He's tragic because he made his son's life miserable. He's tragic because he treated people horribly. He's tragic because he was constantly angry and defiant and made people's lives incredibly difficult. In the episode Returning Japanese, Hank has this dreamlike vision in a sweat lodge, and he envisions the one moment he always hoped he could have with his own father. I waited your whole life to tell you this, boy. You're a good son. And I'm switching to propane. Thank you, Dad. All Hank ever wanted was the respect of his dad and a genuine handshake. And would you believe it if I told you that one of the final moments in King of the Hill reflects this? In the very final episode, in one of the final scenes, Hank recognizes something he respects in his own son, Bobby. But instead of reject it or repress it, he embraces it. And he lets Bobby know it, giving him a true and genuine handshake. Made even more beautiful with the added context of his father, Cotton. While talking about King of the Hill over the past couple of years, I've talked a bit about the very few times we've seen Hank Hill cry. I think the first time I said this was in my Bill video, and claimed that this was the only time I could ever personally remember Hank crying in the series. Every time I bring this up, I get at least a few comments talking about other times he's cried, and after my Cotton video a couple of months back, y'all made this massive comment thread of examples of Hank crying in the series. And these really got me thinking about Hank as a character. He is incredibly repressed, which is why we don't see him cry much. 
but is there any sort of common thread for what does make him cry? So I combed through all of the moments brought up in these comments, and I think we've got the definitive list of times Hank Hill has cried in the series. And it's pretty interesting stuff. So let's dive in and figure out what makes Hank Hill cry. So as we've sort of gone over in countless other videos, Hank is an incredibly repressed individual. I think the primary culprit here is of course his father, Cotton Hill, whose treatment of Hank as a child drastically affected how he would grow to carry himself as an adult. I got my shin blown off by a Japan man's machine gun. So don't come crying to me with your problem. There are actually a few examples of Cotton berating or belittling Hank for showing any emotion as a kid. Hey, what you crying for, boy? It's a good show. I want my binky back. You want your binky back? You gotta come in firing! Obviously, this isn't the only reason Hank is repressed. American society in general seems to want men to repress emotions like sadness. It's not manly, as they say. But Cotton is very representative of that society, and Hank's upbringing very much taught him to keep sadness to himself, buried deep down. Outward displays of pain or sadness are not manly. We even see an example of Hank as a teenager refusing to cry after literally breaking his ankle in a football game, staring straight-faced after the incident, and of course, with Cotton berating him along the way. This is your fault, and you got them weak ankles from your mommy. So in the context of Hank's life, it has to take some seriously major baggage to get him to actually shed tears things that are deeply important to him. A few examples people give me in the comments were actually times when Hank came very close to crying, but didn't quite shed tears. But even these follow this pattern. The first is when Hank's brand new lawn was destroyed by Dale's gas in season one. And this wasn't just any old grass. It's Raleigh St. Augustine. But when he walks out his front door and sees his completely dead lawn, he nearly loses it. <laughs> Hank's lawn is more than just a yard to him, it's a point of pride. It's a status symbol. He sees the lawn as a reflection of his character. My lawn's nothing but ragweed and auto parts. I should be ashamed to live next to Hank Hill. He's got the best lawn in Arlen. And the absolute destruction of that lawn means the neighborhood will look down on his character every time they look at his property. So as far as Hank's values and worldview go, this makes a lot of sense why it would nearly drive him to tears. It's more than just lawn care to Hank. In season six, Buck Strickland briefly promotes Hank to manager of Strickland Propane, and while he doesn't quite cry, he is completely overwrought with emotion, causing him to deeply embarrass himself. Manager? Oh, Mr. Strickland, I, 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 I love you. Obviously, I think if he had cried here, it would have been a tears of joy situation, given that Hank had been the most driven and successful assistant manager that Strickland Propane had ever seen. On top of this to Hank, Buck is sort of a surrogate father figure, and having never received that love from his actual father, this promotion clearly ignited a lot of deeply repressed feelings in Hank. But Hank's job is one of the most important things to him in his entire life. He prides himself on his work in Propane, and the promotion to manager is, frankly, something he deserves, yet has been denied continually. So, of course, this would totally overwhelm Hank. But the instances in which Hank does actually cry say even more about what's important to him. In season one, in Hank's unmentionable problem, Hank is horribly constipated to the point where Peggy is severely concerned for his health, even having dreams about his death. And when she really breaks down about this to him, he breaks down as well and says how lucky he is. To have a woman like you care so much about me, I'm gonna be more open. <laughs> Tell you how I'm doing more and let you in. Now, this is season one King of the Hill, and sometimes the characterization was a little off in those first 13 episodes. I'm not sure I would expect Hank to say this in season two and beyond, but it's definitely interesting in the context of the episode, because the episode itself is literally called Hank's Unmentionable Problem, and his constipation is sort of a strong parallel to Hank being so repressed and unwilling to share his true feelings. They're both intimate aspects of himself that he finds embarrassing, and therefore doesn't want to reveal to the world, even his wife. There's a scene in the episode where Hank literally panics because Peggy is hugging him while he's on the toilet. He cannot even allow the love of his life to see him in that vulnerable position. It's pretty interesting. I do appreciate that he's brought to tears by how deeply Peggy cares for him, though. 
When he sees her imagine a life without him, he feels her pain, and this actually lines up pretty nicely with the next time we see Hank cry, in Season 3's Death in Texas. This is a pretty standard Peggy gets in over her head episode, in which she unknowingly becomes a prison drug mule. She really thought the cocaine was just boggle timer sand. He always tasted the timer sand when I brought it in. I didn't think anything of it at the time. He always said it was very good timer sand. When she finally realizes her blunder, and it's looking increasingly like she could go to prison for a long time herself, Hank and Peggy reconcile with the possibility, and it's honestly a very sweet moment where Hank opens up emotionally far more than we typically see. I'd hate to think where Bobby, Luann, and I would be without you. After this, the family plays whack-a-mole together while Peggy and Hank both cry at the thought of their family breaking up. <laughs> 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 Obviously, Peggy doesn't go to prison, but Hank's love for Peggy and his family is incredibly clear in this episode. And though it doesn't look like they animated full tears, the thought that he and Bobby might be left without Peggy is one of the few things in the series that drives Hank to publicly show this much emotion. In fact, he's actually gone out of his way to make sure he doesn't cry in public on other occasions. In season four is To Kill a Ladybird, Bobby befriends a raccoon that he names Bandit. Eventually, it gets into a fight with Ladybird, and after scratching her, the pair run off, which obviously leads to major fears that Lady Bird might contract rabies from Bandit. Hank goes out and puts up flyers everywhere to try and find her, and when he returns home, he goes into his garage, turns on his power saw, closes the garage door, and he wails. <laughs> In the end, Ladybird fortunately did not have rabies, but there's even another instance in which Hank cries over Ladybird in Season 5's episode Hank's Choice, when Bobby develops an allergy to Ladybird. In this one, Hank is once again faced with the possibility of losing his dog because of this allergy, so he instead builds her a doghouse to stay outside. He gets really emotional at the doghouse's grand opening for the neighborhood, though, as it means that Ladybird would be staying outside of his house for the first time in her life. And we hope... We have made your home as wonderful as you have made ours these past 13 years. Okay, Luann the Champagne. Now, obviously, Hank absolutely adores his dog. He has an incredibly special connection with Ladybird. But I actually think there's even more to Hank's particularly emotional state when it comes to Ladybird. After Hank and Peggy got married, they had a lot of difficulties conceiving Bobby, mostly because of Hank's narrow urethra. When it seemed like it just wasn't gonna happen, Hank got Ladybird for Peggy. And within a year of getting Ladybird, Peggy had conceived Bobby, and Hank credited them having the puppy as the reason that this was able to happen. I always kind of believed that playing with that puppy was the one thing that finally relaxed me in my urethra. So not only does Hank have a genuine 14 year long bond with this dog, but she also represents to him the thing that allowed for his entire family to come to fruition. The thing that allowed he and Peggy to conceive his son. The first step to making their family complete. He has always seen her as an absolutely integral part of their family, and this is one of the big reasons. The next instance is probably the most embarrassing for Hank. In season 5's Chasing Bobby, they go to see a very sad, dramatic movie at the theater. As this older character, played by Charlton Heston, dies in front of his son, Hank breaks down. I'm okay. Please continue to look at the screen. Hank Hill is weeping like a little French girl. Eventually, Hank breaks down even further, but it's revealed that the death of the character in the film was actually surfacing some of Hank's repressed emotions about his truck, which was beginning to break down. I checked this morning, and there was water in the exhaust. This might seem trivial at first, but earlier in the episode, they reveal how much time and work Hank has put in with his truck. He's always fixed her himself. This truck has been through four presidents, three Cowboy Super Bowl victories, and zero mechanics. Hank has had this truck since the 80s, driven it every day, and put tons of care into its upkeep. He is invested in it. And when the car breaks down for good, it's gone. It's like losing a family member to Hank. There's a clear pattern here, but let's talk about this last instance of Hank crying before we break it down. In season six's Tanking It to the Streets, the gang goes on a wild adventure with Bill, who believes that the government experimented on him in the army, leading to his physical decline. In his frustration, he steals a tank from the army base and drives it through Arlen, so Hank and the boys do their best to try and help set things right, taking the tank back with him. When they accidentally drive it onto an artillery range, they are all in grave danger, but Bill takes the tank and acts as a decoy in order to save his friends. When the tank is then blown up, Hank and the gang understandably think that Bill is dead. He's... he's gone. 
Bill's dead. Bill is literally one of Hank's oldest friends, as well as Boomhauer and Dale's. They played football together in high school and have lived across the alley for years. The first shot of the entire series of King of the Hill is these four hanging out. They are without a doubt the closest friendships that Hank Hill has. And Hank can't keep in his real feelings for Bill. That he's a brave man, he's honest, he's sweet. Like a big old stuffed teddy bear. <laughs> I'm gonna miss him. The entire gang cries for Bill here. Luckily, Bill of course made it out alive, but it's nice to see how much they love their friend. So, what is the pattern here? What does make Hank Hill cry? Personally, I think that's clear. Even as an incredibly repressed man who is completely embarrassed to show any sort of intimate emotion, at least in public, he cannot help but express himself when the things that he has invested his life in are threatened. Hank really only cries over things that mean a lot to him, things that he's really put work into and has personal connection with. He nearly cries when his lawn is destroyed, something that takes a massive investment of time and effort on his part. Ditto with his truck, with the added angle that this was something that reliably took him where he needed to go for well over a decade, something that gave back. He cries over the potential loss of those he loves most. Whether that's when he thinks one of his best friends has died in a selfless sacrifice, his dog might be lost or rabid, or that his wife might be going to prison for unknowingly smuggling cocaine. In spite of his repression and his manly facade, Hank is still a very loving person with deep, meaningful attachments. And though it takes a lot, not even he can hide his emotions about the things that are most important to him. I stay mellow watching Johnny two cellos. He talks cartoons, he's a really cool fellow. He keeps you posted on adult cartoons. If that's what you're into, then grab a spoon and a very big bowl of your favorite cereal. Feels like Saturday morning cartoon material. Johnny two cellos, watch him on YouTube. Now enjoy this groove and bust a move.